all right. Hello and welcome to another episode of TCAP Recap. Tonight, I will be serving up a scrumptious feast of crime, cringe, and poetry. Because our predator, Mr. Nathan Downhour, thinks he's John fucking Keats as he attempts to manipulate a 13-year-old girl into having sex with him. The 23-year-old super virgin was a recommendation from several people, actually, and we all owe them a debt of gratitude because this guy was not on my radar. I knew of him. I knew that he was the potential serial killer preto because of his very flat, monotone affect during his interview with Chris, and because of his complete lack of a response to having his life blown up on national television. I mean... I show more emotion when I walk into a room and forget what I came there for. This guy just says, thank you, turns around, walks to his destiny, into the waiting arms of the police. So I knew who he was. I did not know that his chat log was so fucking hilarious. Now, like I said, this guy considers himself some kind of poet because he gives some of the sappiest bullshit lines to this decoy, but they're eloquent in a way, which makes me think that he just busted into his mom's collection of smutty romance novels, copied some passages out just in case he would ever need them to lay the Mac down on a minor, and the opportunity finally presented itself. But I'm so excited to read this chat log because I got myself a boom for my mic so now I can stand up while I'm recording and that really frees up my arms for like you know motions and gestures so I'm gonna get real into this chat log but to wrap up a few details he got busted in the Greenville Ohio sting he was a student in Indiana actually at an evangelical college so he had to cross state lines to get to the sting house And for some reason, he got off super light. He got 35 days in jail, which was just time served. He got two years probation. And he did get RSO status, apparently for life, because he's still on it down in Florida. But crossing state lines, normally the feds get involved and the sentences get harsher, which means he got really lucky or his parents just have money. He does have a case of helicopter parents, as we'll get into as the chat progresses, but his mommy is like the third character here. (laughs) She even checks his phone bill each month to see who he's talking to. Maybe that was just a ploy to keep the decoy from calling his cell phone after he hit it and quit it, but I think he was being honest. I think his mother does still check his phone logs, even though he's 23 years old, which really makes me want to know what the conversation was like when he had to call his parents to let him know that he was in jail for trying to have sex with a 13 year old given that his family is probably really religious as well and overprotective and therefore way more inclined to believe him if he acts godly enough for them you just know that when she talked to the police or was interviewed by the news said something like Oh my god, that Chris Hansen totally entrapped my child. My little Nathan was only going over there to mentor her and to protect her and keep her safe. They doctored that chat log. But I do wonder what his mom really thought when she read this chat log. If she did, I assume she would. I mean, I would want to in her position. But maybe she pulled a Raimundo Anguiano and just pushed it out of her mind, you know? And I don't want to, like, insult or go after his parents because they weren't directly involved. But the fact that she was that over-controlling and that something of this magnitude could still happen, it's not a good look. I mean, he didn't turn into a drug addict or an alcoholic, so she did a good job there. But what was missing that he thought that this was okay? Who taught him that this was something acceptable for him to do? But all right, we got the essentials out of the way, so we're going to jump into the chat log here. I do want to take a brief moment to thank all my subscribers, people who like the videos, watch my videos. It's deeply appreciated. I actually, when I started, only bought a microphone because I wasn't sure if this would like pan out into something that I would continue doing. But with all the positive feedback I've gotten, 
that's why I went out and got myself a boom for my microphone. You know, I'm trying to upgrade so I can keep the content coming out and keep improving it every single time. So thank you. Now let's go splash around in the sewage of Nathan Downauer's psyche, shall we? First off, tell me this guy does not look like Dexter. A little bit, right? I think they bear a resemblance, although Dexter is a lot more handsome. I'll give him that. But secondly, can somebody tell me what this shirt is made of? Because it kind of looks like uh, he draped himself in velvet. George Costanza would be very jealous. Third, this dog is beautiful. I always liked huskies, and this is just a very pretty dog, and he's manhandling it. Oh, man, that poor dog. He does express that he really likes animals, and that's why he was studying biology, so he could be like a vet or some shit. And that trends with sociopathic tendencies, being able to connect deeply with animals, but not being able to connect with humanity, humans. If you've ever seen The Sopranos, you'll know that Tony loves his ducks, his horse, even the little goat that plays with the horse. He likes animals a lot, but he doesn't shy away from throwing a beat down on somebody or shooting them, not to spoil anything. Actually, if you haven't seen The Sopranos, you need to stop listening to this video. You need to go watch it right now because best TV show ever made. And I'll throw hands over that. No, I'm just kidding. But it is a really great TV show, my favorite. All right, let's get back to work. So Nathan Downauer, draped in velvet, he was, like I said, 23. His screen name was Green Eyed 121. According to the TCAP wiki, he has hazel eyes, which, according to the definition that I had just looked up a minute ago, it's a combination of brown, green, and gold, and can appear to be any of those colors, but definitely not just green. Little dishonesties turn into big dishonesties real quick, Nathan. You got to be careful, buddy. So apparently they chatted on MySpace first, and then he hit her up on Yahoo. He introduces himself, Nathan from MySpace, and she hits him with the, have I talked to you? Which, ooh, that hurts. That's like you walk up to somebody and say hello, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, have we met before? Ouch, goddamn, cuts like a knife. Oh, she also replied to two of his emails. So this guy got hooked from three different angles from email, MySpace, and now Yahoo. <laughs> they had him. They had him. He wasn't going anywhere. He is the one with the dog. That is not that descriptive. I mean, a lot of people have dogs. And they're a very popular thing to put in a photo because, as you can see, they make the person look more safe, uh, like safer to be around. They look more disarming because if they have an animal that shows they take care of it, they presumably love it. So how could they be a bad person if they have a cute dog? Many, many predators use that tactic. Kevin Westerbeck, especially, he was the one that had the bird on his head. And that's an especially egregious example because it wasn't even Kevin's bird. It was his sister's. Very early on, Nathan remarks that he's not that far away from the decoy. And he already knows that it's less than 50 miles. He's pretty rude. Apparently he asked her what she would buy if he, she had a $200 gift card. And her response is clothes. Typical response for a 13-year-old person in general, not just a girl. He says, typical girl response. 23-year-old <laughs> guy here, 10 years older than her, talking down to her. And just like Nathan already has his mind on the distance between them, the decoy is already up to the old decoy tricks, coming up with some crazy ass shit. <laughs> yeah, apparently the decoy just moved to be with her father instead of her mother. So he asks her, do you like it better at your dad's? And the decoy says, yeah, at least he does not call me names or try to steal my boyfriends. <laughs> Green Eyed is shocked. Your mom would try to steal your BFs. I'm going to try to say it in his weird monotone way, but it's harder than I expect. <laughs> I use a lot of tonal variations when I speak, so it's hard to go monotone. But anyway, the decoy responds, yeah, my 20 year old BF that I had for a long time, she had sex with him, with him, not with him. All Green Eyed has to say is, ah, too bad. She must have been a little desperate. And as they continue, the decoy establishes that she just got there recently, earlier that week, 
And that's good for Green Eyed. He likes that. He says, cool. So are you by yourself all day? See, I keep on adding just a little bit of shift more than he ever does. So the decoy, wily as she is, uses this opportunity to bait the trap and tell the horny super virgin that her dad and his girlfriend are going to be gone for the weekend, gone to Jamaica, an entire country away. And you can almost sense Nathan's floppy cock stirring sinisterly in his pants as he perks up at the information. And you already know that green-eyed, this is just, he's hitting bingos, like, up the line. <laughs> it just keeps on getting better for him. He probably can't believe his incredible luck at finding an especially vulnerable 13-year-old who knows nobody just moved here and is now going to be alone for four days. He asks her what she's going to do in the house, and here's, he gets weird, like, seriously weird for the first time. He says, well, you can do whatever you as long as you don't ruin the carpet or burn the house down, you could stay up late, sleep in your dad's bed, try on his girlfriend's clothes, underwear included, or run around the house nude. That's what I did when I was alone in the house for the first time. So I wonder what he means. Did he run around nude? Or did he try on his dad's partner's underwear? I mean, his mom's underwear. What the fuck? But it does show where his mind is at. He's thinking of this decoy, nude, doing weird sex things like trying on another female's underwear. I don't want to say another woman because the decoy is not a woman. She's 13. And just in case you don't believe me or the decoy is doubting it that he's a weirdo, he says, send pics if you do. So bam, they got him child porn. Son of a gun. This page just reloaded itself and deleted all of my highlighting. So I had to go through and do it again. Sorry if the screen ratio changed a little bit. But yeah, she has not mentioned that she's 13 in this chat yet, but he clearly already knows because he, number one, saw her MySpace, presumably. Number two, he's already referred to her having school, like junior high. And number three, he actually confirms it right here. The decoy asks him who will take these pictures if she's running around naked and... Nathan says, I would love to, but that wouldn't be the best idea. So he's aware of what he's doing. He knows it's wrong. He's going through with it anyway. He still wants something out of it. So he asks her to just do the other picks then. <laughs> and the bozo snitches on himself here uh, again when he tells the decoy, just have fun. And the decoy replies, oh yeah, all by myself. Nathan says, are you trying to tell me something? Decoy plays dumb. Although I don't think she said all by myself that many times. This is the first or second time. So we can see his mind kind of creating this justification that the decoy is trying to say something and invite him over. But the decoy refuses to play ball, plays dumb instead, replying like what to his question. So he's forced to switch up his strategy and he focuses in on what he probably perceives to be the best weakness for him to exploit, which is the decoy's loneliness, having moved to a new place, having no friends, and having her father leave <laughs> for the weekend a week after she arrives, which I would consider to be a red flag, but Nathan clearly doesn't. He unsurprisingly misses a lot of red flags, actually, and part of it is because the decoy seems so confident that she's already reeled him in and <laughs> got him. She kind of phones it in a little bit. We'll keep covering the red flags as they come up. Another thing to notice is that Nathan appears to have read some sort of handbook on how to pick up women. It's like he's trying out all the tactics of one of those pickup artist YouTube instruction channels that were popular a while ago. You know, he keeps on asking her questions about herself. He keeps making himself sound interesting. And even though the decoy does not give him much to work with, he takes her short answers in stride and moves on to the next attempt to pick her up. So it's very funny to me to consider that he's trying to manipulate this 13-year-old girl with pickup artist lines. And in reality, it's actually the decoy who is trying to manipulate him into showing up at the sting house, half-assing it, because he clearly really wants to come over and do this. It makes his creepy 
unreaction to Chris Hansen showing up even more spooky because he's getting really involved in this girl, putting in a lot of effort. And in a moment, all that just goes up in smoke. It's even more important for him because he's the 23 year old super virgin. For some reason, when I think of Nathan Downauer, I think of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire when him and Cedric Diggory are finally at the end of the maze and they reach out to grab the trophy. And as they do, whoop, they transport to the cemetery to face off against Lord Voldemort. In a similar fashion, Nathan went through all this work and effort and could probably feel his virginity slipping away from him when all of a sudden, whoop, he's transported to this hell on earth where he's getting confronted by an older man but moving on the decoy then says something that instantly dates the entire chat she says that she sings like avril and michelle branch so you know it's somewhere between 2003 and 2008 and of course being a millennial i jammed out to pop punk just like everybody else and in fact I loved Avril Lavigne's song, Girlfriend. That thing was my jam for a little bit in high school. Next, we have a fascinating little bit of prescience from Green Eyed, who is talking about the decoy singing, which he wants to hear. He says, you can make a video and post it on YouTube. And that's exactly what the decoy is going to do, along with the rest of, you know, Chris Hansen's team and NBC. They will post this on YouTube. <laughs> So Nathan is able to open his third eye for a moment there and see the future, even though it's only 2007, a year after YouTube came into existence. And I wonder if Nathan Downauer completed the loop by watching his own segment on YouTube when it finally came out on there, or if he's just kind of ignored it, left the loop undone. Next, Nathan kind of pushes her on getting a camera. <laughs> you know, he says you might be able to rent one, or find a friend who has one, a digital camera. And he makes it seem like he's talking about her singing so she can post it on YouTube. But given what he says later in the chat log, it seems much more likely that he was just trying to find ways to get naked pictures of her. Again, that child porn angle. This guy, I said it before, but I'll say it again. How did he get such a light sentence? He got real lucky. At this time, Nathan has to go, because he has to go to dinner. And the decoy, when they get back in touch, mentions that she's keeping an eye on her father's girlfriend's three-year-old. Here is where Nathan gives off his first strong Norman Bates style, like, mother issues. He first says, I wish I had a baby sister, which is a common thing for people. You know, you wish you had a sibling or a brother or sister, whatever. But again, in the context of the larger chat, it just makes me think that he wanted a readily available dating pool, as terrible as that sounds. But his next line is the creepy one. He says, mom stopped after two boys. And he doesn't say my mom stopped after two boys. He just says mom stopped after two boys. Now, maybe this is a regional thing and I'm way off base here. But I would only ever talk this way to my siblings because we all share a mother. But if I was talking to anybody else, even close relatives, I would specify my mom did X, Y, Z. It just feels like he's pushing an unwanted intimacy on the decoy by talking to her as if they would share a mother, which could only be the case if he married her, then his mom would be her stepmother. I guess if we're getting technical, they can also share a mother if their siblings got married. But in this specific context, it would be if they married each other. Creepy. But if it's a cultural thing or a regional thing, I will take the L and please enlighten me. Otherwise, let's move on because Green Knight is about to make his first major slip up and get schooled by the decoy. After talking about the decoy's stepsister that she's watching... Green Eyed loads up another superficial question and hits the decoy with, did you ever have a pet? Which, of course, she says yes to. She had a cat back in Texas. He uses this opportunity to tell this, you know, little anecdote about one cat that he had that caught a ton of mice, rats, squirrels, and rabbits. And the decoy plays along by saying that her cat brought her a dead squirrel once. 
but it seems like Green Eyed wants to talk about vicious killing of animals a little bit longer, so he brings up how weasels are nasty little critters and are capable of killing a cat. And she spells weasels, W-E-E-Z-L-E-S, which is just a, a moment of levity as they talk about how vicious weasels are. <laughs> I couldn't find any evidence of blood frenzies where they only suck out the blood, but it turns out that they are pretty nasty little critters. So he does know a lot about, you know, random animals that you would see around your home. And he brags about it, saying... I do know a lot about animals, anything you want to know in particular. It's just a weirdly broad question. The decoy, once again, is not going to play the game and just says, I love animals, so he's able to jump into another angle of questioning, you know, what's your favorite, blah, blah, blah. Here's where Nathan gets busted red-handed, stealing somebody else's favorite animal. He says, cat-wise, I like the liger. It's a cross of a lion and tiger. Pretty impressive. The decoy says, LOL, I know Napoleon, question mark, from Green Eyed. Decoy says, that is Napoleon Dynamite's favorite animal, the liger. And caught with his dick out and no cover, he says, I think I should watch that movie. I do not believe for one second that Nathan hasn't seen Napoleon Dynamite. That was a big movie. Everybody knew Napoleon Dynamite. And everybody knew the Liger because Napoleon made it famous. You never heard the Liger before Napoleon Dynamite. Even Mr. Super Biologist here did not know about the Liger before Napoleon Dynamite. Nope, he gets busted cold. So take the L, man. Just take the L. He doesn't wait around afterwards. He moves right on to talking about his favorite horse being the Clydesdale. You see him in all the beer commercials. He's trying to impress her again. But the decoy busts out some names that I don't know. She says, I like the Adelusian. And Green Eyed says, they are very beautiful horses. So I assume she was right. He continues to brag, saying that he's taking horseback lessons. And the decoy says, I miss my horses. So apparently she had horses back in Texas with her mom. Seems like both of her parents are pretty damn rich. Something that Nathan is about to realize. They talk about logistics of him getting to her. And he says that he lives around Hartford City in Indiana. And according to MySpace, they're about 50 miles apart. And he asks her, do you live in the suburb or in the country? And the decoy says, I guess the country. Nathan replies, no nearby houses. I live in the country and all our neighbors are about 600 feet away. Which again... In isolation, this could be argued to be a pretty innocuous line, but when you think about the larger context of him coming over there to rape her while she's alone, it takes on a much more sinister meaning. You know, he's making sure that there's nobody around that can hear her scream. You know, this guy, he comes from a religious family, evangelical family, but he's already showing us that he doesn't follow any of their morality because he's doing this. Is he doing it because he wants a 13-year-old or is he doing it because he's just really fucking horny and has no morals and is going to take whatever he can get? Not sure yet. Let me know what you think in the comments, but let's keep reading. Because now the decoy establishes that her dad is rich. She says, we have seven garages. <laughs> that is so many garages. And Green Eyed says, why so many and then does something very cringeworthy in asterisks. He says, poke Katie after she didn't reply within a single minute and like 10 seconds. And she claims that her dad likes to restore cars. This is another red flag. Like, why is this man with his girlfriend and now his daughter living in this enormous mansion? She's going to go on to talk about how big it is. Now, I know that rich people like to buy houses that are way bigger than they actually need, so maybe her dad could be that kind of rich person, but before his daughter lived with him, and before he was with his current girlfriend, he's just a dude living in a house with seven garages. It doesn't sound plausible. Combine it with the fact that he's just 
up and flying to Jamaica with his girlfriend, but leaving his 13 year old daughter behind a week after she's just arrived from her mother's house, which seems like it's a pretty damn big deal if she's permanently moving from her mother's house to her father's house. But nope, he needs to go to Jamaica. He wants to go smash his girlfriend on the sandy beaches. Peace. There's mac and cheese in the cabinet and (laughs) food in the pantry and make sure you keep all seven garages closed. No, Nathan Downauer had dick brain since before this chat even started. The decoy, knowing this, actually pushes to talk to him on the phone. Normally, it's the preto who wants to call the decoy to make sure they're legit. But nope, (laughs) this decoy's trying to speed things along. So she just says, want to talk on the phone? And there's Nathan's phone number, not edited out. So (laughs) I don't know where that phone number goes now. But he tells her his full name. She says that she's Kat, and they make the phone call and come back. And from here on out, Green Eyed is going to start calling her a variety of creepy pet names. One that he prefers is calling her Soft Voice, which he uses over and over. But the decoy, probably busy dealing with a bunch of other possible predos, says that her dad just pulled up. And just to keep the hooks in him, sends hugs which he really likes. Now, I would be interested to know what happened on March 18. It seems like the decoy squad is possibly in disarray because the next day at 1 a.m. in the morning, the decoy reaches out and says, oh, I'm sorry, I keep waking up. Wish I had someone to talk to. Green Eye doesn't respond because he's sleeping until 6 in the morning and says, I'm awake now, soft voice. Sorry, I wasn't there to talk to you. And then he's going to message her again at 9, 9.50, 9.53. Then Katie's going to message him at 1.30 and 5.30, but he can't answer because he's watching a movie with his brother. So he gets back on and messages her at 6.30, 8, and 8.30. At 8.30, he says, maybe you should leave the messenger on all the time. Then it would be easier to contact you. He's now telling her how to run her messenger so she can talk to him. He gives it as like a nice suggestion to help her out, but it's with the ultimate goal of getting her to talk to him more, which is bad. So it's a little bit controlling. Like imagine telling somebody, hey, maybe you should keep your phone on you all the time. Then it would be easier for me to contact you. It would come across as very weird and controlling, right? But then he repeats this controlling advice only two lines later the next morning He messages her at 6.27 a.m. and at 6.29 says, Please leave your messenger running so I can contact more easily. I miss you. So even though it hasn't been a particularly romantic or flirty chat so far, Katie's basically treating him like you would a friend. He's the 23-year-old super virgin, and he's a bit of a nice guy, quote-unquote. So he interprets friendship as romantic and sexual interest. So of course he misses her. This is probably the nicest girl he's ever spoken to. This next part is very important. The decoy says, so it doesn't bother you, I am 13. And Nathan says, no, it's cool. Katie says, cool, most people are mean. And Green Eyed should really see this inconsistency. But he says... What do you mean? Why are they mean to you? Katie says, because I am 13. And Nathan just posts a bunch of question marks and says, that doesn't make sense. And he's absolutely right. It doesn't make sense. I think the decoy said it because this is a stressful part of the conversation. She needs Nathan to continue going along with her, even though she's bringing up once again that she's 13. She's basically reminding him that this is an illegal act. This is a crime, but she wants it to seem more casual. So she makes it seem like she's asking him about her own age because other people have been mean to her because she's 13, not because it's illegal to do what he's doing with her. But unfortunately for Nathan, he is just blown away by the prettiest voice he ever heard and he's unable to see what's going on. They continue talking. He says he's getting a degree in biology so he can go work at Bush Gardens, the zoo. And while Nathan's going off about different flowers, the decoy just rudely brings up, how far are you from me again? 
and Green Knight is right back into the logistics, says she's about 45 minutes away. Decoy says, that's not far, and asks him, you gonna come visit when my dad leaves? Nathan says, sure, I was gonna ask you later, though. I was going to ask on Wednesday. It might be the only chance I ever get to see you. The decoy asks, why the only chance? And Nathan says, because your dad and girlfriend won't be there. So he knows that this might be the only chance he ever gets to see this 13-year-old girl, but he's going to continue to try to get close to her, lead her along so he can eventually have sex with her and then never see her again because she's a whole state away. Now that the trap has basically been sprung and Nathan shows no fear, no suspicion, I don't even think he considers that this could be a sting. A lot of predators that we watch, they kind of yo-yo back and forth from being horny and all for it, then backing off and saying, wait, this might be a trap. And let's be honest, it probably has to do with them jacking off. Like once they do it and they clear their head, they're not so horny for a minute and they're like, oh shit, this is a bad idea. But then the next day they forget about that and get horny again and eventually show up to get arrested. So Nathan does a lot of superficial talking about, you know, either himself or the decoy, and we don't need to get too far into it. It is funny, he recommends the movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey, which, good movie, but he mentions messing around as well. He wants to listen to her voice, he wants to bring movies for her, but per decoy policy, the decoy just keeps putting it back on him, so he gets to pick whatever movie he wants. The decoy hadn't made any outrageous claims lately, so they say that they were in modeling, and Nathan wants to know what kind of modeling, like clothes modeling, sports, and the decoy says, just did modeling for pics. And Nathan's like, well, they normally have a purpose, and the decoy doesn't elaborate, so another red flag, although I'm, I guess a 13-year-old could just make stuff up or not remember but it's followed by a real red flag. Nathan asks for the address, but the decoy says, I'll give it to you when my dad leaves. (laughs) Obviously, they don't want him to have the address and show up earlier than expected, scoping the place out or something. No alarm bells in Nathan's head. He just accepts this and keeps going. They start talking about what the decoy wants to be when she grows up. Uh, First, she says a vet because he says a zookeeper, and then she says a singer. They talk about calling each other. Nathan says, so I must bid thee adieu, which is very much like fedora neckbeard language. (laughs) And here it is. Nathan admits that he wants sex. The decoy says, what else you want to do when you come? Be creative, do whatever you want and go as far as you want. What do you mean? Like sex? If you want to, but that's your decision. I don't know if you're really nice. And here we go. Nathan is starting to get more excited and eloquent. And I'm going to start reading his lines in the voice that he probably hoped the decoy read them in. A nice, you know, suave voice. Because he's trying to be poetic. He says, Now you have my heart pumping and my blood racing. Good night, beautiful. I will chat with you again tomorrow. Till then, sweet dreams. And then he does a quick yo-yo back up and says, I just remembered, please don't tell anyone that we might have sex, or if we do have sex, we would both be in a lot of trouble. So just if you think that he's some ignorant incel who's just too horny to know better, no, he's telling her that they'll both be in big trouble if they get caught having sex. Not true. He's going to be in trouble, not her. So he's clearly manipulating her. And he does tell her, but I want to tell you that I think it would be worth the risk. So he sinks all of his ships for court, which brings me back to the point. How the fuck did he get off so easy? This is like an open and shut chat log. They don't talk at all on the 20th of March, which is weird. This decoy, you can tell that she's distracted and has a bunch of stuff going on and is in multiple chats because she keeps on asking him to say things over and over again, like, how far are you from me? But the superficial chat continues. He kind of negs her a little bit by asking what she likes to read, and she says the Harry Potter books, and he says, well, everyone says that. 
anything else, like some snooty asshole. And then he claims that he reads about everything, even cookbooks when he's bored. The decoy asks him to bring a book when he comes to visit, and I assume that's like Jerry Griffith's pie. They want him to bring something specific so they can tie him to the chat log. And here, an emergency. The decoy had told Nathan that her father was leaving Thursday, but now she remembers it's Friday, and he's worried because he needs to go home Friday, and he doesn't have a good excuse to give his parents about going anywhere on the weekend. Again, this is a 23-year-old man, and he's still saying stuff like, I have to be home or my parents will be suspicious to this 13-year-old girl. And the decoy acts worried, like, oh no, what's going to happen? And Nathan says, be happy, be hopeful. So Nathan is actually kind of yo-yoing between this noble romantic image he has in his head and then just sex stuff because now he's going to start getting graphic. He wants to ask her some questions. Uh, she tells him that she's had sex. And Nathan starts talking like he knows what he's talking about. Like he's had sex, even though he's a virgin, a super virgin. They talk about oral. He says he's going to perform cunnilingus. Just like all the predators getting kind of obsessed with that kind of stuff. It's nasty. And then he gets all excited because he can come over on Friday he thought of an excuse to tell his parents so he can come and rape this 13-year-old girl. There's something just so sinister about it. Like, I lied to my parents a lot in my early 20s. I was a total shithead because I was using drugs and behaving recklessly. But when compared to something like this, doing heroin in a parking lot seems almost innocent compared to what Nathan's trying to do right here. And I don't have kids, but if I did, I would much rather find out that they were doing drugs than doing this kind of shit. They continue to celebrate. The decoy uses so many extra letters. It's ridiculous. He is such a fool that he can't recognize the difference in tone with this decoy. Sometimes she'll be distant, short answers, on the verge of being rude. And then other times she's saying, I am so excited. Here's one of my favorite parts of the chat log. He gives the decoy his cell phone just in case he gets lost and she needs to call him. But Nathan says, Okay, but must only use it for an emergency. I share my cell plan with family and mom watches who I call and who calls me. What the fuck? Come on. That is taking helicopter parenting to a whole new level and such an invasion of privacy. Here's an example of what I was talking about, uh, the decoy getting lost in which chat she's in, because the decoy asks, so what do you want to do while you're here? Nathan says, haven't we talked about this already? But then he goes on to describe what they're going to do anyway, because he wants to talk about what they're going to do. He offers a recommendation saying, maybe we could do a photo shoot of you wearing your dad's girlfriend's clothes. He wants to get this girl into her dad's girlfriend's clothes a little too much and here it is everybody the gold mine of eloquent romance i'm not going to be able to read all of these lines because some of them are so raunchy and gnarly that it's too disgusting but the poet down hour has now entered the chat he says we could make out my hand gently brushing your face as i gently kiss your beautiful lips if you still wanted to kiss, I would continue, drowning in the softness of your lips. Then I would do it to you, our tongues wrestling with each other. He then says where he's going to kiss her, which is basically everywhere on her face and head. And then he wants to know, where would you kiss me, Katie? And she asks, where do you want me to? And he gives this strange answer. He says, the same places would be nice. The rule of thumb here is that everything is fair game. And this is a trait we see in a lot of Pretos. Uh, Chris Urban always comes to mind. They want the decoy to return the strength of their feeling, but the decoy won't because the decoy is a decoy and they are, you know, perverted predators who are way too sexually intense to be around young girls. These damn bozos are just too fucking horny sometimes. Freaks you out. Like Nathan must be all horned up now because he says, I want to make love with a beautiful woman. You. He knows this is a 13-year-old girl. He realizes that. And this is where things 
get a little too raunchy at points, but he starts off saying, I will gently cup and massage your soft breasts, kiss them and run my tongue along them. So it sounds like Nathan went to the Maurice Wolin school of kissing breasts. I will kiss them. Nathan continues, I will gently flick the nipples with my tongue and massage them till you moan. And now I just want to give a content warning because like I said, this is raunchy, raunchy shit. But Nathan gets it so totally wrong on the anatomy that it becomes hilarious. He says, Then I will kneel between your legs and bring my face close to your clit. Your clit leaks juice between your legs and I begin to slowly but constantly lick it. Then I take my finger and slowly insert it into your clit. You moan and jerk a little, but you are so tight, hot, and wet on the inside. I gently and slowly remove my finger and then ram it back in. This dude thinks that he's sticking his finger and dick into a clitoris. He has no fucking clue what he's talking about. Another crazy line he says is, As I begin to enter you, the heat and tightness of your clit seeks to overwhelm me. I have become lost in the pleasures of your clit, myself nearing orgasm. Finally, we come together, crying out in unison. So, even if he hadn't told us, this would prove beyond reasonable doubt that Nathan Downhower is a super virgin. It sounds like he's writing a penthouse letter rather than an actual sexual experience. Combined with the fact that he has no idea what the fuck is going on below the belt for women. And the whole thing becomes rather funny. But remember, he's saying this to somebody he believes is 13. Seems like this would be pretty traumatic for any 13 year old girl to hear from a guy like him. Just like so many other predos, you know, Jerry Griffith, Chris Urban, they build up the decoy, this idea of the decoy in their head. And then that's who they start having a conversation with. Nathan Downauer isn't responding to what the decoy is actually saying. He's responding to this scenario that he's baked up in his head. This is some crazy shit to say even to somebody your own age. And you know what? He couldn't have copied this from smutty romance novels or penthouse letters because none of those would make the mistake of thinking the clitoris is the vagina. So yeah, I do think that Nathan Downauer made up all this shit, maybe not on the spot, but this is 100% a product of his mind, (laughs) this ridiculous sex messaging. Let's just move past it because it's kind of grossing me out. The decoy only really gave one word replies to him like, wow, OMG, and finally tells him he's a good writer which maybe isn't the thing that he wanted to hear. It's a nice compliment, but he's probably whacking off right now and wants to hear something sexier. But the sex messaging has given him the confidence to ask a question of the decoy. He says, I did it with another girl, but I don't know if you want to. Call me up and let me listen to you as you finger yourself to orgasm. That's a bold fucking thing to say and to ask of a 13-year-old girl. This guy thinks that she's going to get on the phone and do this for him. What the fuck? He's not the first preto to ask the decoy to do some really grown-up stuff before they've even met. It adds just another layer of nasty because it's like he's remotely molesting her. It's like he's trying to molest her using her own fingers. (laughs) The decoy naturally says, nope, can't do it. Dad just got back and... Probably because the decoy was a little bit sickened, she ends the conversation and doesn't talk to him for the rest of the night. He still has hope, saying, oh well, maybe we can do it tomorrow. No, you can't. We are approaching the end. They're getting down to the final details. And Green-Eyed uses a common trick. He says, oh, I may have to leave earlier than I wanted on Saturday morning. Can't get around explaining that to mom. He's setting up his exit strategy long before he arrives. This way, he can get there on Friday night, smash, and then leave early Saturday morning, telling the decoy, hey, I told you I had to leave early. What do you want me to do? And still, the decoy hasn't given him her address. It's just another continual red flag that she's being so reticent about the address, 
and continually asks him, when are you going to be here? You're going to be here at noon, right? Which we know, of course, is because they need to schedule all the different pretos. He doesn't think anything of it. And here, Nathan puts on his more pathetic side. He says, I was wondering, since I described what I would do to you when I came over, maybe you could describe what you would do to me. Decoy says, LOL, I will show you. I'm not good at that stuff online or on the phone. Okay, but I am expecting to be thrilled. Wonderful, soft voice girl. Again, with the soft voice. If he was a serial killer, he would be collecting voice boxes and like their trachea. Because he just can't get over her soft, wonderful voice. And I hope that Nathan is feeling pretty awkward at this point. Because he went into a lot of detail put a lot of effort into that sex chat, and the decoy just says, LOL, I will show you. <laughs> oh, and then the classic cop question, asking what kind of car he drives. Again, no alarm bells for Nathan. He does not stop to question once if this is actually a 13-year-old girl. <laughs> the decoy is basically killing time by now. They're just saying random superficial shit like, you're so sweet. I'm so glad I met you. Green-Eyed says, I somehow feel that you have had it rough in the relationship department. And when the decoy implies that it's getting better now, he says, I mean, you met me, right? Yeah, Nathan, the decoy's relationship life is getting better because she met some creep who's 10 years older than her, who's going to stop by to bang her and then leave, never to see her again. Such a gentleman. Okay, let's get through the rest of this so we can get on to the good stuff. Finally, he thinks that he can get the address because it's Thursday. He's going to her house the next day, Friday. And he asks for the address. The decoy says, I'm going to find a piece of mail to get the address. And asks him for like the 20th time, how far is the drive for you? <laughs> And she makes him promise that he won't come till tomorrow at noon. And Chris Hansen must have told the decoy to slow down because she changes her mind and says, I'll give you the address tonight. Maybe Chris Hansen read this chat log and was like, man, this guy is fucking railing lines of horniness and is just high on horniness. We can't let him have the address. He might show up in the middle of the night to rape all of us. Of course, Green Eye doesn't think anything of it. And he actually gives her a warning. Just watch out for those older men with their little perverted minds. So that's funny. He thinks that other older men with their perverted little minds are a risk, but not him. It's a stunning lack of personal insight that he can't realize that he is the perverted older man. I am positive that Nathan would look back on this chat at this point and think to himself, Damn, I am such a gentleman, and smooth as fuck, too. I've really impressed this 13-year-old girl, which is important to him, because after all, she isn't a virgin, whereas he is the super virgin. But alright, we are basically at the end. The decoy finally gives him the address, and he's relieved. He asks her what she wants to eat, because he's going to be staying for a while. Bro, you ain't staying for a while. You just don't know it yet. So the decoy just says, whatever. And he reaffirms that he is bringing the book for her. And right here, he shows a little bit of awareness that this is not a safe situation for him to get in because he asks if there's any houses around her house and says, well, I don't want them to get suspicious if they see an older guy like me come to see you. But the house is in the country, so there's nobody around. Apparently, the house has seven beds and four bathrooms, which again, what the fuck is she doing there? I mean, she says that her dad is in real estate, so maybe he's house hopping, you know, just living in whatever nicest house he's selling. But that doesn't make much sense to me. I don't know much about real estate, though. Is that something that realtors do? Just randomly move into big houses that they haven't sold yet? I doubt it. But correct me if I'm wrong, please. And just some for the road, he wants to ask a couple sex-related questions, asking how many times she's had sex, and does she like a certain position? Humorously, the decoy says she's only done it six times, just from behind. 
I always considered doing it from behind to be like a more advanced level of sex. The natural thing is just like missionary. So it strikes me as suspicious that she would say only from behind. However, we are dealing with Nathan, so he doesn't think anything of it. He gives one final nice guy line. So I must bid thee adieu. And then as a final power move, he says in asterisks, hugs and a long French kiss goodnight. The decoy basically ignores that and just reminds him to come through the back door instead of the front door. And that frustrates Nathan. He says, okay, did you read the last thing I wrote to you? I would have thought it would have gotten a response. And the decoy is just like, yeah, I will give you one when you come. So that's the end of the chat. Speaking as somebody who has texted a lot in my life, the decoy's responses throughout the chat just seem to ooze this sense of going through the motions, like she's just saying the right things to say them without really caring. But of course, I'm not all horned up like Nathan Downhour was. He is unable to see anything outside of his penis vision. And so he says goodnight to her, goes to sleep so he can be well rested for his big sex romp the next day, and ends the chat. That is it. That was a long one. So if you're still with me, much appreciated. I've been trying to keep my videos a little bit longer because I'm getting a lot of feedback that people enjoy them when they're longer. So let me know if this is too long. I know the chat isn't as exciting and dynamic as this segment, but hopefully you enjoyed this. So let's move on to the segment and interrogation. All right, everybody, welcome back. First off, I want to thank Dr. Julian Bashir for posting this video. I'll drop a link in the description. But otherwise, we're just going to jump right in because that chat log was way too fucking long. So let's go. So uh, day one came and seemed fine. All right, first things first, you all know that I like to comment on how fast they pass the barrier between the outside of the house and the inside. Nathan Downauer doesn't hesitate at all. Even Kevin Westerbeck, when he entered that same door, stuck his head in first and said, hello, before going on to be a real creep and pervert. Nathan Downauer opens the door, walks in like he owns the place, shuts it without a word, stares around with that creepy dead-eyed expression of his and then starts walking to go find that decoy. Being the super virgin, we know that he's very motivated to lose it and convinced that he's properly wooed this minor to the point that she's just going to be ready to hop right on him. And throughout the chat log, we didn't see him pause once to question whether this might be a sting operation or something other than what he expects. So at this point, he is 150% certain that he's about to get his dick wet. Instead, he gets smacked with the Hanson, and you would think that his lack of preparation, his inability to suspect that this might be a sting, would make him more shocked and surprised than the average Preto. No, he keeps the same dead-eyed look on his face the entire time. Hey, Nathan. Yeah. I just cut the crap out of my toe. I'm getting a Band-Aid. Hold up the kitchen counter for a second, okay? <laughs> I like how Dell limps up the stairs, even though he can't see her. She's really dedicated to the part. In this case, as in the previous investigations, we worked with the computer watchdog group, Perverted Justice. It's decoys going to chat rooms, posing as 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kids, uh, home alone. I'll be right back down. Would you do me a favor and just go have a seat right in the outside of the bar? Ooh. And take your hands out of your pockets for me. Go ahead, have a seat. Ooh, the walk of shame. As a potential predator walks in, there's a whole other investigation starting outside the house. The sheriff's department is moving into position trying to monitor what's going on so there are no surprises. The police are set up in a house across the street. There's a motor home. You know, they've got the entire area covered. A lot of behind the scenes in this episode. 
What are you doing here? Came to visit somebody. Those dead eyes, man. You can see like just the slightest hint of a smile. At least I think I can see it. And he's considering in that moment like, oh, fuck, what just happened? What am I going to do? What am I going to say? What the fuck is happening? But his face doesn't move, doesn't show any of those thoughts. Who did you come to visit? Katie? Katie. How old is Katie? Thirteen. Thirteen. And how old are you? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Do you see a problem <laughs> with that? Of course, whatever facial expressions Nathan lacks, Chris Hansen more than makes up for with his wide range of facial contortions. That's yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And w what is the problem that you see? She's 13. That small sigh right there is about the most reaction we're going to get from Nathan for a little bit. He's willing to admit that, hey, I fucked up. She's 13. But he doesn't seem to understand the severity of the situation and how much trouble he's in. He probably thinks, hey, you know what? It was a mistake. I won't do it again. I'll just walk out of here and go back to my life. Because that's what people who haven't faced the law before tend to think. And then they find out, oh shit, my parents can't get me out of this. However, I say all that with the caveat that this guy did get off really, really light and easy, which fucking sucks. But let's continue. I mean, there seems little doubt as to what you wanted to do here based upon the chat. You could stay up late, sleep in your dad's bed, try on his girlfriend's clothes, underwear included, or run around the house nude. <laughs> in this moment, Nathan is realizing all of the stuff that he said, including all of that extremely explicit sex talk, was being read by this guy and who knows how many other people. Maybe he thinks that Chris Hansen was the one on the other side of the computer talking to him. And he's thinking, oh shit, I said all that stuff about the clitoris to this guy. But again, this uh, raising the arm up to put it against his face, that's how he shows reaction. Instant messaging allows for a way to talk differently. Talk differently. You're not actually facing the person, so you don't have to deal with the embarrassment of saying those sort of things to their face. He is correct, and that's the big problem with online bullying and why bullying can get so much worse when it's online. Because it's easy to tell some screen name to fuck off, but you, it's not as easy to say that to somebody's face because you have to deal with the instant ramifications right then and there. You tell somebody to fuck off in real life, they might just slap you across the face. But you can just heap abuse on somebody online and never have to deal with it in some cases if you're talking to somebody you don't know or don't see in everyday life. Like, have you ever had an online conversation that wasn't appropriate, whether it's, you know, sexual or vulgarity, whatever, and then had to see somebody the next day and kind of pretend like it didn't happen or it wasn't... You know, you didn't tell them to go fuck their mother. I've been in those situations before. It's it's uncomfortable, but you just got to power through. Let's go. So it doesn't bother you. I am 13. No, it's cool. You get into very graphic detail mm -hmm. about what you want to do to her. He wants to stick his finger into her clitoris and then jam it back in there. <laughs> Fantasies dreamed up online or in your mind. Fantasies dreamed up online are in your mind. It's like he's trying to be super cool. Like that really deep guy at the party who's just speaking in riddles and is so dark and mysterious. But he's not at a party. He's across the table from Chris Hansen. Come on, man. Get it together, Nate. Things you might not be able to willingly do when it comes down to it. Nathan Downauer starts out. So I am pretty sure that he would have been 120% willing to do all of that stuff that he said. Granted, he wouldn't be able to insert his finger into a clitoris, but 
that doesn't mean that he wouldn't have tried his best to do it. Saying, look, this is just all fantasy. And I wasn't really going to act on it. And, and what I said really wasn't that bad anyway. Then I started going back through the chat, and I'm reading him passages that are quite explicit. Well, after I remove your shirt and bra, I will run my hands along your body's smooth skin. I will gently cup and massage your soft breasts, kiss them, and run my tongue along them. <laughs> As Dr. Maurice Wolin always said, I will kiss them. Mm -hmm. And it goes on mm -hmm. from there. In graphic detail. What are we to make of this? Now you have my heart pumping and my blood racing. I just remembered, please don't tell anyone that we might have sex or if we do have sex, we would both be in a lot of trouble. I know it's wrong. But I want to tell you that I think it would be worth the risk. How uncomfortable must Nathan Downauer be right now? Because he is, you know, evangelical Christian, going to an evangelical college, this is all kind of out of his wheelhouse under the best of circumstances. It's not like he's at college partying and having fun and doing drugs and having sex. No, he's probably sitting around like reading the Bible or some shit. And now he's sitting in a very mundane, rather ugly living room being grilled by a older man he does not know. I guess it's possible that his non-reaction is simply because he's so shocked that he doesn't know what else to do. Like it's progressed beyond showing a normal scared response and he's just flattened to the point that he can't even move his face muscles. What should happen to you? I'm not sure. I don't know what the law says about this. Well, it's illegal. But nothing has happened yet. I don't think Nathan had a clear understanding of how the law works in Ohio. What he thought was, okay, I might be in trouble for this chat, but I can't be arrested because <laughs> I hadn't actually had sex with a girl yet. I just showed up. But that's not how the law works. Oh, well, I love it. I love it. <laughs> you can tell when he says, I'm not really sure what the law says, that he thought, Okay, I'll get a slap on the wrist, maybe a ticket, maybe a misdemeanor, but it's not that big of a deal. I just said some stuff online and then showed up at the house. Eh. Wrong-o, Nathan. wrong -o. But it's illegal for someone to use the internet to solicit somebody who's 13 for sex. Hmm. That I was unaware of. You were unaware of. Mm -hmm. Why would you think it would be lawful to do something like that? <laughs> it didn't catch my mind. It didn't catch your mind that it would be wrong for you as a grown man to come into this home where you thought a 13-year-old girl was home alone after this sexually explicit conversation. The law was broken. Hey, maybe it came across his mind, but just like Raymond Anguiano, he just pushed it out <laughs> because of what he said online the solicitation and the fact that he showed up it didn't matter that there really wasn't a young teenage girl in the house waiting for him to have sex he according to the authorities was uh, was uh, breaking the law so I was actually talking with somebody in the comments recently about this, that how are these guys charged with crimes, even though there's not actually a 13 year old girl or any victim at all. And I'm not a lawyer, but it basically has to do with the intent. If the prosecution can prove that you intended to commit that crime, regardless of whether you succeeded or not. If they can prove that you intended to follow through with that crime, whether it's, you know, rape, murder, you get charged and you can get charged with intent without there being an actual victim. You know, if you shoot at somebody trying to kill them, but you miss, you're still going to get hit with attempted murder. So that's what's going on here with the whole intent versus victim thing. If you know more about it or know more details on the legal side, 
please let me know in the comments because I would be interested in finding out more about this. Well, Nathan, there's something I got to tell you. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story about adults who try to meet Ooh. underage Oopsie. boys and girls for sex on the internet. Mm -hmm. If you have anything else that you'd like to tell me, I'd be happy to hear it. If not, you're obviously free to walk out that door. Thank you. Anything that was a very cheerful thank you. More cheerful than I remembered. He's got no reason to be this cheerful. You just want to slap him across the face and be like, dude, be upset or at least show some kind of regret or contrition. Show some emotion that shows you're a human, <laughs> that you're not just some cold, unfeeling robot or serial killer. Anything else you'd like to say? No. Okay. I finish my conversation with Nathan. He leaves. <laughs> Sheriffs arrest him. He's taken to this auxiliary building for, for the next step in the process, which is to be... He's taken to this auxiliary building. I like Chris's pronunciation right there. That was good. Processed and, and ultimately interviewed by detectives. When you got here, what was your plans for today? Were you coming to meet her? When I came through the door, I pretty much already reached a conclusion that this was something I couldn't go through with. Oh! <laughs> Predator bingo right here. That is the classic Preto excuse. Almost all of them say it in some form or another. Well, I was driving over here the whole six hours and halfway through I decided I wasn't going to do it. So you can't charge me with intent because I'm a good guy. I changed my mind. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. I already, I thought about the whole drive over here. And... So I figured I'd just tell her face to face that <laughs> we could spend time together, watch a movie, whatever, but there wouldn't be anything beyond that. Once again, it's just such bullshit. Of course he was going to do something. I do think that he was thinking about it the entire way over, but he was probably thinking about it in a very dirty way, imagining sticking his dick into clits, whatever, whatever he thinks sex is. What were your plans? As far as what you guys are communicating. Our plans as far as we were communicating, or as far as I was thinking at the moment, mm -hmm. was a sexual activity. Okay. Bingo. But the possible repercussions of that actual, of actually doing it, began to gnaw on my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about it. What would happen if I got caught? I was <laughs> caught. The only thing he had on him was a pocket knife. Is there anything else in the car? Under the left seat, there's a box of condoms unopened. Uh-oh. That was supposed to be for something different. This guy's a super virgin. What else were they for? Again, his entire story doesn't make any sense. He was going to do it, but then the possible repercussions of getting caught stopped him from wanting to do it. And then he did get caught. So now he's using the fact it, it just doesn't make any sense. I, again, am blown away that he only got 35 days in jail and two years probation. It's crazy, but at least he's still on the RSO and at least it's still keeping him from doing this kind of thing again. I wonder if he ever lost his virginity or if he's still a super virgin to this very day. I just never used them. Do you have a girlfriend or anything? Nope. Nope. When's the last time you had a girlfriend? Never. Never? <laughs> Never. Have sex? Nope. Never. <laughs> so you have a box of condoms with you. You've never had sex before. The whole plan was to have sex with this 13-year-old when you got here. Correct? That was the original plan. At this point, you're going to be charged with unlawful sexual conduct. Attempt of unlawful sexual conduct with a minor. What's the penalty? What's... It's a felony of the fourth degree. And it goes on my record, correct? <laughs> so I'm going to be tried for it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to go on my record, right? Yeah, dude. It's a felony. 
It's going to follow you around for the rest of your life. I'm starting to think that Nathan Downauer might also just be a fucking idiot more so than he's already shown. Like his mom sheltered him so much that he just has no idea how the real world works. And now he's ended up here. He doesn't ask for a lawyer. He straight up admits everything. Uh, you'd think that this would be a slam dunk case and he would get five years, but nope. Just a couple weeks in jail. Nathan spent the night in the uh, Dark County Jail. Yeah, big deal. 35 days in jail with 24 months of probation. Pathetic. Okay, anyway, that is the end of Nathan Down Hour. I know that this was an especially long episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you made it all the way through. I do want to apologize for the lack of recent uploads. I'm going a little bit slower right now because my brother is actually getting married this weekend. So I've been busy with that. But after he gets married, I'll finally be able to get back to what I really want to do, which is making more TCAP content. So I hope you're having a great day or night whenever you listen to this, and I will catch you on the flip side.